Hello and welcome to Symmetries and Quantum Mechanics. In this short video, video series, sequence of videos and lectures, I will take you through a journey from the basics of quantum mechanics through to uh, some of the more advanced topics that you will encounter in your, your physics uh, undergraduate and graduate training. Uh, because it's mathematically what we're going to do in this course is not particularly advanced. We're going to stick to linear algebra for most of the course, probably in the entire of the next lectures. There'll be about five or six lectures on this. Uh, so the, math the maths is not very, very complicated. But, uh, and even the concepts are, in, in a sense, not that complicated. But it doesn't correspond well to any graduate course or undergraduate course that I've seen. Uh, so the concepts are new. They're new, as in you won't be able to find these in a convenient graduate or quantum mechanic, a graduate quantum mechanics textbook. Um, people just don't describe this material in this way. So it's pretty simple, pretty elementary, but the concepts may very well be new to you. And in fact, the way I will take quantum mechanics and sort of tear out axioms, and, and that will also be quite unusual uh, compared to uh, the typical treatment you'll find in a quantum mechanics textbook. So the, this course is really built on one book, uh, and uh, that's the, uh, uh, the main reference for this part of the, for this course. And it's a, it's a book called Linear Representations of Finite Groups. Uh, it's by J.P. Serre. It's a delightful little book. I'll be only covering maybe some 20 or 30 pages of this book. Uh, it's written for a mathematic, well, J.P. Serre is a very well-known uh, mathematician. Uh, and this book is largely intended for a mathematician audience. However, the part of the book that we will be covering in this course or uh, following um, was a course that he gave for quantum chemists. So the material in the book, although mathematical in nature, is uh, targeted at a physicist audience. So it should be readable. I'll try and convert a bit of the notation in the book so that it looks more kind of familiar and quantum mechanical to you. It uses slightly different mathematic notation for some, some concepts. And um, yeah, and so that, that'll be the main, main reference. There are other references in this course. I might name them as I go by, but pr probably not. Um, the only other reference that might be worth keeping an eye on, although it's sort of impossible to read uh, at this stage, is uh, the quantum theory of fields. By Steven Weinberg, uh, like the spirit of this of these lectures is probably closer to the way White Weinberg is talking about quantum fields, uh, and otherwise I don't really have a, a good a good book to cover this material. So the main source will be these videos. Okay, so what do I suppose you know? Okay, there's only a handful of prerequisites for, for these lectures. Namely, I would hope that you know the postulates of quantum mechanics. And I like to do quantum mechanics according to the Hanover rules, uh, which you can find summarized in my video, one of my recent videos uh, called quantum mechanical essentials or, so, or something like this. So the way we like our postulates here in Hanover is a bit different to the way you see the postulates presented in your typical quantum mechanics textbook. Uh, we focus on mixed states, density operators as, as fundamental uh, states in quantum mechanics and the probabilistic nature of the quantum mechanics as a theory. All of this you can find summarized in this video. Uh, it was uploaded last year, I think. And 
uh, that should be enough for you to sort of know what I'm talking about in terms of postulates. I also have a German version of these postulates, which you can find in my videos on Theorie de Chapuzzi T. Uh, also, you know, linear algebra is a must. At least you should know the following words. Projection, direct sum, tensor product, uh, kernel, and image, complement, and of course, eigenvalues. And vectors. Okay, that's what you need to follow these lectures. Uh, I do warmly invite you to get hold of this book. As I said, it's quite a delightful little book, um, and it takes you on on quite a journey. So, if, although we're only going to cover the first twenty to thirty pages, if you keep reading, you'll learn some fairly fairly deep and interesting. Uh, stuff about representation theory, which is just independently interesting. Uh, what else do I want to say? I guess that's it. Um, so I'm going to dive straight in and talk about the postulates of quantum mechanics for a couple of minutes and the role of symmetries and how we can effectively get rid of one of the postulates of quantum mechanics. So let's start with the postulates of quantum mechanics. According to the version that I like to present, there are five plus one postulates. And we'll briefly, I won't actually review them except to focus on two of them, just so, so that you uh, know what I'm going to mess with. So the five postulates of quantum mechanics plus one uh, have to do with kinematics and dynamics. And roughly speaking, the first four postulates, the way I present it, are just dealing with effectively kinematics, although secretly dynamics in disguise, right? So the first four postulates of quantum mechanics, as I present it, go roughly as follows. The first one is about, to every quantum mechanical system, there's a Hilbert space attached. The second one is that states uh, of quantum mechanical systems are represented by density matrices. The third one says that detectors or measurements are represented by positive operators. And the fourth one talks about the Born rule, which is how what happens if you do a measurement and, and connecting the empiric average of your measurement record with expectation values. So that's sort of the four basic uh, axioms of quantum mechanics. Actually, with just those four, you can do a surprising amount of physics. Uh, but then there comes a fifth one, right? And that's the Schrodinger equation postulate. And that's the one that we're going to really focus on uh, in this course. And we're going to talk about replacing that particular postulate and effectively throwing it out. Uh, so the fifth one is the Schrodinger equation. What's the sixth one? That's got to do with composite systems. Like what happens if I have a quantum mechanical system built of two other quantum mechanical systems where well, you've got to use the tensor product. So that's the sixth postulate. We'll be kind of using this later on in the course, but it's not really essential for, for this part, um, for the first part of the course. So I'm going to take aim at the fifth postulate of quantum mechanics. Postulate five. I'm not going to write it out. I'm just going to simply say this is the one that has to do with dynamics of quantum mechanical systems. And I'm going to argue today that we don't need it. You know, that Schrodinger equation that you were told was so fundamental and so on for quantum mechanics, turns out that you can argue that, you, that it's a consequence. It's a consequence of the other postulates. This is sort of a little bit cheating, but uh, and your, some people will call it cheating, the way I'm going to argue. 
Um, on the other hand, I don't really find it cheating. I just find it points to something deeper uh, in the structure of quantum mechanics. What I should say, however, is that the first four postulates do actually contain dynamics, right? Um, the reference to dynamics. In particular, you know, the preparation of a quantum system being characterized by a density operator and the measurement of a quantum system being characterized by some positive operator E, a detector, uh, you know, the difference between preparing and then measuring uh, can be uh, the dynamics, you know, what happens in between the preparation and the measurement can actually be simulated by, by having a different density operator or by changing a measurement, right? So this fifth postulate has to do with a more specific way with how we attach the passage of time dynamics with the way these things change. So effectively postulate one to four does effectively contain dynamics in a, in a sort of generalized way. So I'm not really deriving postulate five. I'm just gonna give you an argument for how postulate five could be generalized or how to fine grain postulates one to four to cover much more interesting kinds of dynamics. And this will turn out to be really essential for when you move on to high energy physics, quantum field theory, uh, where uh, the Schrodinger equation, or at least the way it's presented usually, can lead you into confusion. Um, whereas if you think about the way, I think about dynamics the way I'm going to present it in this course, I would hope that it feels very natural. Okay, so that's just a couple of words about uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics and kind of the goal here is we're going to throw away five and understand dynamics um, in a more generalized way. as being uh, an assignment of measurements or, and, or preparations of your system that model things happening. And what kind of things are we talking about here? Well, the main word that we're gonna focus on in this course are things called symmetries. So what's postulate five about? Postulate five is really just a prescription for a certain class of symmetries that act on a quantum mechanical system. You have your system, and then there's a symmetry that can act on your system, namely, wait some time. Waiting some time is a symmetry, right? In your system. And the operation of wait some time is a symmetry operation that can occur. So we're going to start talking about symmetries as operations that uh, occur or can be performed on your quantum mechanical system. That's the most generalized sense in which I understand the word symmetries in this, in this course. A symmetry is an operation that can be performed on your quantum system or that can occur. And what kind of operations can we allow in quantum mechanics? Um, so we'll talk about symmetries as operations. The most general kind of operation that can occur in quantum mechanics is something called a completely positive map. I'm not even going to define these things in this course. We don't actually need them. Uh, you can, however, find a definition of these things in my, a course I gave on the theory of quantum noise and decoherence, if you wish, if you wish to follow this up. But I do want to say that from the outset, those operations which preserve the structure of quantum mechanics as a theory in the most general way possible are things called completely positive maps. And a symmetry operation, if it's an operation, if it's a physical thing that can occur in quantum mechanics, has to at least be one of those things. Actually, we're going to argue uh, presently, I'm going to argue 
that it's, it's not going to be CP maps, it's going to be a very small subclass of CP maps that can occur or that can be interpreted or understood as symmetries in quantum mechanics. So we're here, it's the, the key take-home assumption that I'm making at this point in the course is that symmetries are operations and that they're physical operations that can occur or can be uh, performed on a quantum mechanical system. So we won't talk about the interpretation of the word symmetry yet, like, you know, what does it mean to do a symmetry operation? We're just going to say, here by definition, symmetry operations are physical operations, or otherwise known as CP maps. And we want to just start to understand symmetry operations uh, as generally as possible, and then we're going to try and unpick um, these, these general notions and try and attach mathematical definitions to these things. And then uh, it'll lead us very quickly uh, to the theory of group representations. So the first thing we want to do is talk about, uh, or is something I want to emphasize, is that one symmetry operation by itself doesn't really have very, doesn't, is not very meaningful thing to talk about. Really what happens in, in nature is that we have multiple operations that we can do that are symmetries. And what matters is how these symmetries uh, perform, uh, behave with respect to each other when we do one after the other, right? So what we're talking about is that actually, you know, Actually, we have um, almost always in physics we'll have sets of symmetries that we want to perform or that can occur. So I already gave you a huge set, right? I implicitly defined a huge set here. Wait for some time, T. I said that's a symmetry of a quantum mechanical system, also of a symmetry of other, of other physical systems. Uh, well, uh, how many symmetry operations are, are possible? Well, they're labeled by T, time, and time is a real number. So actually, this first example here of a set of symmetries, namely waiting for some time, is a huge set, right? It's for every possible time, for every possible real number, there is a corresponding symmetry operation called wait for that time. Now, that's for an autonomous system. Um, if your system is time dependent, then the set gets even, uh, it gets more complicated to describe, but if you, then you need kind of two numbers. You know, evolve me from start time to end time. But let's assume we have an autonomous system here so that it's a symmetry, right? Waiting for some time is a symmetry of your system. Okay, so actually, always we have sets of symmetries. Always, when we talk about symmetry operations, we, we have in mind probably something more than one. And I'll get to some examples in a second. So actually, we have sets. Um, and, well, they have labels, right? And these labels, mm, we put them in a set. There's a set of all possible labels for our symmetry. We'll call it G. Now, corresponding to each symmetry, there's like some things that we would like to be allowed. You know, we, we, what we'd really like is if we can, uh, there's a couple of consistency conditions that we want to enforce, impose on our symmetry operations. For example, there's one symmetry we must always be allowed to do, which is nothing. We should be allowed to do nothing. Not wait time, you know, just doing nothing at all should be a symmetry. If that's not a symmetry, then Okay, go and rebuild physics. Um, it, that, that's, uh, you could do that, but you know, for this course, doing nothing is a symmetry. It should be the case that if you have one symmetry and then you do another, then that, as a t in total, like that, that, that thing that you did, first that symmetry, then that other symmetry, that also should be a symmetry, right? It should be admitted as an allowed symmetry. And then finally, we should, if we can do a symmetry sort of forward actively do something to the system to rotate it or whatever, then it should be that the operation of undoing that should also be a symmetry. So there's sort of these three consistency requirements that we would hope um, all are allowed symmetries. So if you have, and I'll summarize them now. All right. So doing nothing. That's got to be a symmetry.
And then if you have two possible operations you're allowed to do, so you've got G1, a, a symmetry labeled by G1, a symmetry labeled by G2. So this could be, for example, wait for T1 seconds, and this is wait for T2 seconds. Then um, I must be allowed to do one then the next. And I'm going to draw, draw a funny little circle here to mean uh, that means composition, right? Do one, then the next. So this is composition. It, it should be clear what I hope what composition means, right? It means do one, then the next. And then there's a third one we want, right? You know. So if you can do some symmetry labeled by G, then there, there sh ought to be undoing G ought to be a symmetry too. G inverse ought to be, there ought to be a label of a symmetry. Okay. So, yep. All right, that's a good question. Is, is going back in time something that we ought to be able to do? It should be a symmetry. It, it, whether, so there's a, the, what we're going to have to struggle with in this course is the idea of being able to implement a symmetry or not. <coughs> is this something that we as humans have active control over? Sometimes we don't have active control over what, what uh, symmetries we, we can perform, right? But the thought, uh, the experiment of going back in time ought to be an allowed symmetry. It's just that we're never able to perform it, right? That's the main, the main challenge. Um, what it, it turns out that for some systems we can perform going back in time, but we have to have kind of ultimate control over those systems, right? So, uh, we can't make time go backwards for ourselves, but if we have ultimate control of a trapped ion, then we can let it evolve forward in time. Maybe it goes around the Bohr sphere a couple of times. And then we ought to, by doing some operations, be able to make it go backwards around the Bohr sphere. So that's also, it should be a loud symmetry. We just don't always, we can't always perform the symmetry ourselves. So we're talking about what is possible versus what we can do at this point. So we, we admit that going backwards in time is possible, but we may not always be able to do it. All right, so why have I written down those things so, ever so suggestively? Um, well, because those, I've just defined for you something called a group, right? A mathematical group. I'm certain most of you know this definition, but I'm gonna write it down anyway, just to set notation. Um, So a group is a set of things, of labels in our case. Together with a law of composition, so uh, a, a way of putting one thing after the other or or multiplying so there's the law of composition. Take two elements and it gives you a new thing. Um, Okay, I used a, a, like this circle thing here, but almost immediately I'll get sick of drawing the circle, so I will just write the composition as just concatenation like that.
So I didn't mention associativity uh, in my warm-up motivation for this definition, but this should hopefully be also something that you would agree had better be satisfied by a set of symmetries. Uh, namely, it better be the case that if I do compose you know, the symmetry labeled by Z, then the symmetry labeled by Y, I do that first, and then I do the symmetry labeled by X, it better be the same as if I had done it that way around. I mean, you could, you're free to explore what happens when you throw away such axioms, uh, but it leads to uh, notions of semi-groups, monoids, and so on, that aren't, you know, not even monoid, uh, that are harder to analyze. And another comment that's worth making at this point is all the symmetries that we have in physics, it appears that they are captured by group, these group structures anyway. So that's why um, the associativity, uh, we'll keep it. Further, um, here comes the doing nothing thing. So G contains a special element nice thing about the, this, this element is that doing nothing means you do nothing and it behaves as if you did nothing. So you can do nothing before you do your homework or you can do your homework and do nothing. It's still the same thing as doing your homework. And here comes the inverse thing. object in algebra in mathematics you probably have been exposed to it before there is a very the theory of groups has a long long history with uh, decades and even centuries of development we won't really need that much of the theory of groups in this course Something very interesting about mathematical groups is that there are rich, they have a rich set of examples. So there's not everything can be a group, like not any set is a group. In fact, lots of sets are not groups, right? So the ones that are have structure, they've got interesting, um, there are interesting patterns that you can see in groups, in examples of groups. There can be finite groups, there can be infinite groups. At this point, what I'll do is take the time to give some examples. Now, each of these examples has a physical uh, reason to be. Like I'm going to give you a list of examples, and each of them um, do appear in physics somewhere or another, and I'll try and give you some sense of where that is. So the first example is the set of numbers with addition modulo 2. So this is a group, so the set itself is comprised of two elements, 0 and 1. Uh, and there's a 
composition rule, which means add modulo 2. So uh, x, y is like x plus y, which is addition modulo 2. That's the group operation for this set. So we can draw up a little multiplication table to understand this set. Or composition table, so you, you can have 0, 1, 0, 1. So 0 compose 0 gives 0. 1 compose 1 gives 0. 0 compose 1 gives 1. And 1 compose 0 gives 1. So there they are. That's all the possible uh, compositions that can occur in this tiny little group here. This group appears everywhere in physics. Most often in the context of a reflection. So you have your system and you imagine that it's reflection symmetric. Like you can take it and you can sort of flip it and you get the same system again. That's one of the most common symmetries in physics. Uh, also, for example, the charge conjugation is an example. It's called C. C is an operation that you can do on your quantum mechanical system. You conjugate charge, and then you conjugate it again, well, you get back the original thing, right? Uh, you've got parity. That's what I've just explained. That's, uh, that's, that's reflections. And of course, you've got time reflection as well. PCT. These are the fundamental uh, reflection symmetries of physics. And T is a bit hard to imagine. Uh, you know, can you take your system and, and run time backwards? Well, actively, probably not, unless you have very good control over it, as we, uh, as we discussed. But certainly, it should be an allowed symmetry. Those are symmetries that can occur in quantum mechanical systems. They can be broken as well. They can, they can be, exist systems where these symmetries are broken. It's pretty easy to imagine how to break parity, right? Just take something that's not reflection symmetric and now you've broken that symmetry. It just means it's no longer a symmetry. So there's nothing about, you, you know, systems can fail to have a symmetry. That's kind of boring. It's when systems have a symmetry that it's interesting. So we go group of reflections. That's an example of this. And what I want to highlight is something I'm about to codify in a definition. It's that somehow we have the same group of, of symmetries as, as addition modulo 2 but we've given different labels to them, right? So there's the do nothing and there's the do to charge conjugation. So I've given, you know, it, the, the structure's the same, right? The multiplication table's the same, but the labels are different, right? So aren't the, these should be the same things, and we get, we'll give a notion of sameness in a second, what it means for two groups to be the same. And what other examples that I have here? Ah, oh, yeah, let's go through a couple more. Um, the integers um, with addition. This turns up all the time in lattice systems in quantum mechanics. You can imagine you have a lattice system, you know, regular lattice, and you can just shift it by one lattice unit. That ought to be a symmetry, right? It looks the same before as afterwards, lattice. Uh, and as a bonus, we can have Cartesian products, right? If you have a two-dimensional lattice system, a grid, a regular grid, I can move up, I can move to the right. I can undo those moves, I can compose those moves, and there is a do-nothing move, right? And then what about waiting for some time? Yeah, we've seen that one already. The real numbers with addition. That's also a group, right? There's a real number. You can add two real numbers. You can, uh, the addition is associative. There is a unit element, namely zero, in the case of real numbers. Different label is, we call it one in this definition here, but I've just labeled it differently. And yeah, there we go. We have a group. And that could correspond to or be the labels for, say, waiting for some time t. 
or it could be the labels for translating in a certain direction. Translation in space, that's a symmetry as well as translating in time. What else do we have? Now we're going to get into some really interesting territory. Namely, we're going to talk about your um, the symmetries of the square. So suppose you have a system, a molecule, which is exactly a square. And this square has two sides, and these sides are diff distinguishable, right? You've got, uh, so somehow it's got a blue side, and if you flip the square over, then the square has a pink side. Okay, so you have a square, your molecule has somehow a chirality, right? It, it maybe is some magnetic moment in one direction, and it's a square. So you can take your square and you can flip it. And you can also rotate the square and you get the same square again. So the symmetries of the square. That's a group, it has a name, it's called the dihedral group D4. Very interesting group because this group is non-abelian. So I haven't said this word yet, but now I'm saying it. Um, well, I better tell you the other symmetry operation before I say that though. So you can flip the square, but you can also rotate the square. So you can rotate by pi, pi over 2 radians, and you get the same square again. So there's kind of three rotations you can do, and you can do flips, and you can do combinations of rotations and flips, and then you end up with eight elements, eight distinguishable uh, symmetry operations. And that group of symmetry operations is called D4, the dihedral group. And this group is one of the first examples of groups which are non-abelian. So I'll just put a little box here. Abelian versus non-abelian. A group G is abelian if X compose Y equals Y compose X for all X comma Y in the group. Abelian groups are somehow simple or easier. We may see that in the future. And there are, of course, non-abelian groups, which is just, what does that mean? It just means not abelian, right? So a group is non-abelian if this is not true. So these two examples here are definitely abelian groups, three examples. Addition is abelian. Do it one way, you do the other. You always get the same answer. But the symmetries of a square, that's not abelian any longer. You can rotate it, flip, but that's not the same as flipping and then rotating because you can sort of go back the other way, right? Okay, two more examples. Now we're getting into some really heavy territory here. Now we're going to talk about a very serious group indeed. 
This is a non-abelian group. It's one that you're familiar with. Namely, all the linear transformations invertible of some ve complex vector space. Okay, I've just used a word that I haven't defined, uh, and I'm actually going to come back, circle back to this and define this word in a minute. Uh, but so for the moment, we, we're going to denote by GLV, general linear group, uh, the set of all invertible linear maps A that go from V to V. So, uh, And of course, uh, we can identify the set of all invertible linear maps of a finite dimensional vector space V with just n by n matrices. And how do you do that? Well, you take some basis. action of A on some basis element is because it's a linear map, it's got to be a linear combination of things, namely basis, and it's a basis. And like so. So a linear map can be represented in terms of its, and I use the word represented here, we're going to come back to that word. So a linear map uh, may be identified with an n by n matrix as long as you furnish a, an additional basis here note that this basis need not be orthogonal not not orthogonal not orthonormal we have no inner product I, although i wrote a ket here that was that's physicist notation at this stage of the definition there's no inner product one final group and this is the one that we'll end up focusing yep question yeah. That's correct. So at this moment, we're not applying this to a Hilbert space. So all I'm assuming is that we have a complex vector space with no inner product. The minute I furnish an inner product, which I'm about to do right now, um, then we will uh, have a new notion uh, of symmetries. And that's the one that really ultimately is the, the ultimate group of symmetries in quantum mechanics. So we're going to write it right now. So let H be a Hilbert space. and the set of unitary operators This is the master group of quantum mechanics, as we'll see. Well, plus one tiny wrinkle. So we've covered some examples from the, the trivial to the slightly sophisticated through to the very, very challenging 
and uh, to the most general. So one thing I want to point out is that of these examples, almost all of them are infinite, right? In, in order, they have an infinite number of elements. So let's just go through. And this group here is infinite, but that one's finite, right? That only had two elements. Um, the symmetries of the square is finite. It only has eight elements, which you can verify yourself. Uh, but this one is infinite. This one is infinite. This group here is infinite. It's a finite dimensional vector space, but the number, number of possible uh, invertible linear maps on the, this vector space is infinite, right? You just have to differ by epsilon and you get a different, different element. Uh, and this set down here is also infinite, even when H is two dimensional, right? So the set of two by two unitary matrices is an infinite number of those. So UH, this is the, as we'll see, and as I'll argue, is effectively that UH is the master group of all symmetries in quantum mechanics. It's the most important group in quantum mechanics. This takes a, a actual a theorem to, to justify. But once you've seen that theorem, then you will hopefully appreciate the significance of U of H. Now, all of these have a physical uh, interpretation, including GLV. In some instances, GLV is the set of symmetries of certain space times. It can also be, in certain instances, identified with, if I'm not much mistaken, Lorentz transformations in certain uh, dimensions and configurations. GLV is a very large group, and it has as its subgroups uh, all the interesting groups of symmetries that occur in physics. Almost all, almost all. Right. Good, then I better tell you why uh, U, v, U, U of H, sorry, the set of unitary operations, why that's so important. You, at this point, I mean, you're no? Hilbert space, unitary operators, yeah, sure, I can believe it, but no, what, what's the real argument? You know, it, there could easily be, and it turns out there is, additional operations, which are symmetries, but not unitaries. That's a little bit of a surprise, at least I find it still surprising. Uh, what is further surprising is that, you know how I talked about the most general physical operations in quantum mechanics, these CP maps, you might think that the most general symmetries in quantum mechanics would be some weird group of all completely positive maps or something. Well, it turns out, and it was only really worked out in the past couple of years, that uh, those such, such symmetries, these completely positive maps, will effectively be the same as this unitary group. So that's a, a, a sort of interesting piece of research that's been sort of on, on a low boil for the past decades. And now we're kind of clear now that U of H is the set of all possible symmetries of a quantum mechanical system. But before I talk about those, I better tell you about what does it mean for two groups to be the same, right? It's kind of intuitively clear, I hope, what sameness means. Like, it's, you know, if I do charge conjugation, that's the same group as if I just add, add numbers modulo two. It's the same, right? You, know, you have two things, you do them, and they behave exactly the same way. It's just the label that differed, right? So that's the only ingredient that's really missing from this material in this course. What is sameness? And for that, we'll talk about what is similarness. What, what does it mean when two groups, uh, one is, uh, features of one group are reflected in another group? What does that even mean? Like how, how can we quantify that? Well, we have words for this. So let G and H be groups, right? You've got two of them now. We're going to ask the question, when is one somehow contained or similar or reflected or 
uh, aspects are uh, the same as another group? Well, there's a definition for this. A homomorphism Okay, so two groups are somehow behaving the same if there is a thing called a homomorphism between them. So homomorphism is a way of identifying elements in one group, namely H, with elements in the previous group, G. And what identification should be allowed? Well, they better respect that product rule. So if I do the symmetries and then I identif identify them, then it better be, I better get the same thing as if I had done the identifications first and then do the symmetries. And also doing nothing ought to be the same as doing nothing, right? So, so a map that has these properties is called a homomorphism. That's how we identify or find uh, similarities between groups. And of course, we had some homomorphisms already. Uh, I'll just write out one example. Um, you know, we had Z to Z. And there is a homomorphism to the set of charge conjugations. How did that homomorphism work? Well, F of zero was identified with the identity operation no charge conjugation, and f of 1 was do the charge conjugation. Okay, and there, there, we will see throughout this course like numerous, numerous examples of further homomorphisms. So we've reached the point now where I've given you a kind of bare minimum of uh, structure in order to discuss symmetries. From now on, symmetries will be labeled by groups. Now, this is where I am sort of going to tell you a bit of a lie, right? I said all symmetries should be labeled by groups or elements of groups. It turns out, and it's, this is an understanding that's only now coming uh, out in research, that groups may not be quite the right structures to capture all symmetries of physical systems. It turns out that in general, we may need something more more, more generalized than just a group. I'm just going to write this down. I mean, I'm not going to talk about it in this course. Uh, there is a more general structure out there which has every right to be attached to symmetries of certain physical systems. And the things that we may have to admit as symmetries in in physical systems uh, aren't really completely captured by the structure of a group, but rather a thing called a fusion category. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. It's a rabbit hole that takes a good year of, to explore. Um, but just know that 
this isn't the final word, right? There is actually, we're slowly discovering additional uh, operations that we want to allow as symmetry operations in infinite dimensional quantum mechanical systems. Whether this has physical relevance is still a little bit, it's a little bit uh, up for debate. Uh, certainly the universe in which we live in appears not to directly require fusion categories to describe the symmetries of it. Uh, these things are somehow emergent or effective symmetries. So we will, uh, I just wanted to be clear that I'm telling you a kind of a white lie. Like not all symmetries of physical systems will be labeled with groups. There is something more out there. But if you, if you think that I have a physical system, all the symmetries of it ought to be labeled by a group, then you're pretty safe. Like this is All right, now we come to the, what I think is uh, one of the most important theorems in all of quantum mechanics. Yo, a question? So with regard to the comment you just made, in quantum, still, you still, it's still completely true right, that all the symmetries are quantum. I'm just, you just couldn't make it. But not in general, generally. Yeah, you ask a good question. Okay, so you know, is it true that in quantum, for just quantum mechanical systems, this is the set of all symmetries we should, uh, is this the group of all symmetries? I'm, I'm kind of struggling here because um, we have to, there's a bit of semantics that I kind of was a bit unclear about when we were talking about the word symmetry, right? You know, what does it mean, symmetry? I said, well, you can do one, then the other, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I told you this story, and you, you kind of agreed with me when I told you this story, right? You sort of did. Um, and then I lied, you know, I kind of was a bit, bit, bit misleading in telling that story. So if you think about, if you interpret those words the way I did on the board, then this is it. This is all the symmetries that are in quantum mechanics. It turns out that the words I said can also be interpreted differently. Uh, and there, you know, this idea of composition, what does it mean to do one than the other, can actually be replaced by something more general in term, and in terms of things in uh, mathematical objects called categories. Uh, yeah, but I just want to have it said, you know, that there is this disclaimer, disclaimer, the story I told you is slightly incomplete. But if you, if you accept what I said, and you, you, most of you did seem to, to find it palatable um, that doing one thing than the other ought to be a symmetry as well, then we're, down, we're stuck with groups. It really is this. So the next thing now is this most important theorem in, in quantum mechanics for me. This is really kind of an amazing result that I would love to highlight now. And that is something called Wigner's theorem. And Wigner's theorem is the justification for that statement I made here, that, that UH is the, the group of all symmetries. To tell you Wigner's theorem, I won't prove it in this course because I have a video proving it, um, but I've got to tell you what it is. So to tell you what Wigner's theorem is, I have to give you a definition. And the definition of some is, is of a word, or of two words in this case, symmetry transformation. Notice the difference here. I've said the word symmetry. Now I'm saying I'm going to define something called a symmetry transformation. There's an additional word here to distinguish it or make it clear that what I'm talking about isn't quite the same as that.
Okay. Here's a thing. I'm going to define a thing, and then I'm going to argue that this thing makes sense physically, and then we'll understand what these things can be. So a thing called a symmetry transformation, what is it? Well, it's a transformation T, and it trans it's invertible, so you can undo it. And what does it act on? Well, it acts on rays in Hilbert space, right? So this is thing, right, in quantum mechanics, that the states of quantum mechanics in your typical quantum mechanic textbook are rays in Hilbert space, right? So equivalence classes of vectors in a complex Hilbert space. The way I avoid that in the postulates that we do here is that we talk about density matrices the whole time. And rays are identified one-to-one -one with density matrices, and that's why we can, uh, pure density matrices, so that's why we can avoid all this discussion of rays. For what it's worth, uh, they're equivalent, and the formulation of Wigner's theorem is in terms of rays. You can formulate it in terms of density matrices, and that has been done in the past five years. You win nothing new thereby, so I'll just do it this way. So it's, it's an invertible transformation of rays, which means the states, right? It's just saying it's a transformation of states. Because each state of a quantum mechanical system is identified with a ray or a, or a trace one or pure, pure density matrix. And what does it do? Well, it's not just any old transformation. It preserves transition probabilities. So uh, if you have some transition probability to go from one state to another or from one uh, ray, uh, ray to another, that transition probability is codified in this, this, this number here, this probability. And it better be the case that no matter how you transform your ray, whatever representative you choose of this transformed ray, that the probability of this transition happening in the old untransformed states is exactly the same as after. So that's, that's a symmetry transformation in quantum mechanics. Note that at this stage, it could be nonlinear. And that's what's so amazing about the theorem I'm about to write down. Symmetry transformations, nowhere did I say the word linear. So they can do horrible things to the states. But Wigner tells us that that's not the case. Yo. What do you mean, what do you mean by the bracket um, psi not a? Okay. Uh, so what do I mean by this notation here? That's the equivalence class of all vectors in Hilbert space that are identified up to a phase. Uh, so then how about I write that down? All right, so it's the equivalence class of all, all, all things differing by a phase from psi naught. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I could put it inside. I, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I find this kind of amazing because at this stage, like, there's nowhere do we need linearity, right? We don't need that our maps act linearly. Symmetries could easily be nonlinear. If you think about like, like vector flows in, in fluid mechanics or something, then those symmetries of fluid mechanics are, are deeply nonlinear things. You know, liquid could flow there, it could flow there. The vector fields compose in a horrible nonlinear way. Um, why on earth should anything be linear? Uh, why is it that the symmetries of quantum mechanics just turn out to be linear? Well, they do. Um, and that's the, that's the part that I find amazing, right? So.
So this is an incredible result where we've taken a search space, which is potentially horrendously gigantic, the space of all nonlinear maps of Hilbert space. And by assuming something, namely that transition probabilities before and after a symmetry transformation had better be the same, otherwise what on earth did we mean by symmetry, um, we throw out this vast search space and we end up with only a small subclass of operations, namely linear ones, unitary maps or anti-unitary maps. Anti-unitary is a bit unfamiliar perhaps for you. Uh, here's the definition. A, a map is anti-unitary if you're doing it on a complex scalar of a vector is the same as conjugating that complex scalar and then doing that symmetry operation like that. Turns out that time reversal symmetry acts like this. Yeah. Charge conjugation symmetry can act like this. So in this course, we don't, uh, th these are two classes of symmetries, so we will often just focus on, and they behave effectively the same, right? So anytime you, you derive a result for unitary kinds of symmetries, there's this one small modification, and then you've derived a result for anti-unitary symmetry. So we're going to focus, therefore, on these things in, in this course. Unitary operations. Yeah, a question? Do you say what representation um, is exactly? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Uh, yeah, will I say what a representation is exactly, is the question. Uh, yeah, I, I will. Um, at the moment, we'll just uh, interpret the word representation as a thing that behaves the same as. Uh, I will give you a formal definition presently, I think. So uh, the one thing I should say is that this theorem can be proved, and it can be proved with basically elementary algebra. I won't give you the proof. You can find it in the 18th video of my... Uh, video 18 of the Advanced Quantum Mechanics lecture series. You can find the proof of that theorem there. It takes about a lecture, as I said, elementary, effectively. So now I better tell you what representation means. Um, So representation means homomorphism or isomorphism, invertible homomorphism. That's the simplest.
Okay, let's first talk about linear representations. I mean, what's a representation? A representation is a mapping between two things. More important are the subclasses of representation that we think are somehow special because they are furnished by things we can do. So the first thing doesn't really have anything to do with quantum mechanics directly per se, but it's terminology you need to know, so we're going to spend a large part of the course talking about it. Our, when we talk about quantum mechanics, we're going to have things called unitary representations. So a unitary blah, 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 is a mapping row that goes from your group into unitaries like that. I'll talk about that in a sec, but let's first talk about linear representation. So this is the standard um, notion that appears in the representation theory of finite groups and infinite groups. A linear representation of G in a vector space or on a vector space, I somehow prefer the terminology on, it's a homomorphism row, so it's a map between, from the group G, the thing, the abstract thing, the labels, to the, the doings, the actions, namely the, the rotations, the isomorphisms of your vector space. So representation is a homomorphism between one group to another group. Remember, GLV is a group. So G is somehow found inside of GLV. That's the, that's the, the way you should be thinking about this notion that you can uh, effectively do the same things as these label, abstract labels here with matrices, right? You have actual matrices with numbers in them and they behave exactly the same as these weird abstract operations in your group there. That's a linear representation. And yeah, and what does it mean? Well, you have to have the, the product rule is the same and the identity is obviously the same, right? It's the N by N matrix identity. This is the no we'll spend a long time talking about linear representations because everything we say about linear representations will hold without any difficulty for unitary representations, which is a bit more specific, right? So this is for like, if we lived in a universe where we could do invertible linear maps, this would be the right notion of, of our system having a symmetry, but we don't live in that universe. We live in a quantum universe. And a quantum universe is one where any operation which is a symmetry has to be a unitary or an anti-unitary map. So in the quantum universe, to talk about a representation of our symmetry, we need a homomorphism from our group G, you know, that the labels, the abstract things, into another group. What's the right group? Well, the group is UH, the set of unitary operators on your Hilbert space. So that, that's the thing, right? U of H, the set of unitary operators in your Hilbert space is the master group of all possible symmetries that your quantum system can have. Your system has the symmetries that you are interested in only when you have a homomorphism from G to U. And I would like to come up with a non-example. I mean, we're gonna see examples, examples, examples. But I wanna, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of if I can come up with a non-example in a short period of time. And the answer is yes, I can. Okay, here's an, because uh, I want you to understand why it's non-trivial to find these things. And then you, maybe you'll hopefully kind of appreciate better this, this group representation theory stuff. I'm gonna write down a non-example in this space here. I'm not gonna justify it or prove it or anything like that, but I just wanna uh, illustrate why there is interesting stuff going on here. So let's take non-example. Let's take the, the Hilbert space of two qubits or of a four-level quantum system. Let's take the group to be all Lorentz transformations. So a Lorentz transformation you know, is a four by four matrix. It has all these coshes and cinches and blah, blah, blah. It's a big group. You might think, well, I want Lorentz transformations as symmetries of physics. I want my Lorentz transformations to act non-trivially on my Hilbert space here. I want a unitary representation of Lorentz transformations. Too bad there does not exist one. Right? There does not exist a homomorphism 
from Lorentz transformations to, uh, to unitaries on that is non-trivial. And this is what makes physics kind of hard, uh, quantum mechanics kind of hard. Uh, there's a trivial one. Here's a trivial homomorphism. Every single Lorentz transformation is represented by the, the identity matrix. Okay, does that work? Well, let's check. Well, rho of anything is the identity matrix, which is the same as the identity matrix times by the identity matrix. And rho of the identity matrix is the identity matrix. So that's a trivial representation. It's a boring representation of this Lorentz group. Uh, there is no non-trivial one that acts on this Hilbert space here. In fact, you can go further. It turns out that the group of all Lorentz transformations cannot be represented on any finite dimensional Hilbert space. There is no unitary representation of the Lorentz group on a finite dimensional Hilbert space. That's why to, when you want to marry special relativity and quantum mechanics, you need infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And that's why that drags you towards the theory of quantum fields. There's just no way of doing it on a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, so that's where, that's kind of like a teaser, you know, where are we going? Um, but before we get there, we want to understand more about these things that we're calling linear representations and unitary representations. What are these very strange objects? How do they behave? How many are there? Are there many? Are there, are there very few? Do they exist? Are they non-trivial? Can, uh, can we classify them? Do we know all possible representations? Can we even ask that question? These are the kinds of things that we're going to focus on in the next couple of lectures. The relevance to physics is always there. We're going to focus on this thing here. That's the group of all unitary simulation, uh, unitary operators on a Hilbert space. And we're going to ask questions like, could a quantum mechanical system have the group of all Lorentz transformations as a group of symmetries? And the answer becomes non-trivial. Can the group of rotations be a, a group of symmetries of a quantum mechanical system? Answer, yes, of course, you know this. But uh, it's, there's an interplay between the dimension of the Hilbert space and the structure of the group and then it gets extremely um, intricate and combinatorially challenging to work out some of these questions. Okay, but that's it for today. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.